Happy Christmas Eve to all you celebrating. I wanted this video to take place in a Christmassy place, specifically an airport that had some Christmas decorations. I'd heard good things about Copenhagen, so today we take an adventure on Scandinavian Airlines Systems, or SAS, in the business class cabin of their A330s to San Francisco. My journey begins at Copenhagen Airport's Terminal 3, where it admittedly took me a little bit to find the entrance. Once inside, the check-in desks are all downstairs. I didn't see a standard check-in, all self-check-in at quick glance, but that was fine. By scanning my passport, I got my boarding pass and bag tag, then I headed to take the bag to bag drop and upstairs for security. Once upstairs, we saw some excellent Christmas decorations along with the catwalk that took us to the security where it was labeled for domestic, international, or fast track. As a business class traveler, we have access to the fast track lane, although there was a very large family in front of me, so it took the same time as I'd imagine normal security would have. Through security, we reached the smaller duty free shop and enter the terminal. We actually passed through fairly close to the SAS lounge, hence the position for this fast track security, but I wanted to see some Christmas decorations first, so let's walk around a little bit. In my opinion, Copenhagen has a nice terminal even without the Christmas decorations. The only issue is that there's a lot of construction going on obstructing some of our views. No worries though, it just means that you all get to use your very creative imaginations. The airport has wood floors instead of the normal linoleum or thin carpet. It gives it a way more homey look in my opinion, and then by pairing that with the white walls, the terminal is really nicely put together. I didn't feel like Christmas decorations here were over the top, but definitely noticeable in each hallway. Lights and gifts seen almost everywhere, even a large Christmas tree outside the main security entrance and duty free shop. Admittedly, Copenhagen Airport is much larger than I thought it was. The Schengen flights make up most of the traffic, then there's a couple of different wings of gates for the non-Schengen flights. With some views of the setting sun amongst a ramp of partially obscured scaffolding and construction, we can see a few planes, although the American-bound wide bodies are out of the scene, being a few more rows of gates away. Speaking of which, we have to head that way for departure and the lounge, so let's make our way over to the SAS lounge, which is right around the corner from immigration checks. This is important for two reasons. One, do not go through immigration right away, as there's basically no shopping and restaurants and no lounge. It's also important because you now have to factor in a little extra time to get to your gate, considering you have to pass through the immigration checks. The terminal sign said 10 minute walk from here, but if there's a queue at immigration, it could obviously take longer. The lounge has technically two lounges. Upstairs is for the Star Alliance Gold passengers, but as business class passengers, we entered the downstairs portion where we saw Christmas decorations basically just in the form of one Christmas tree. Personally, I think this is one of the better looking lounges, albeit a bit busy this time of day. I had originally planned to scope out the top floor of the lounge as well, but due to my inbound flight being delayed and wanting to explore the terminal a bit, I was only left with about 10 minutes to explore this lounge. I do think the buffet area looked nice, with a good amount of selection of wine and other drinks. The food seemed a bit more basic, however, as there was largely just meat and eggs, but they did have some gluten-free options at least. As far as seating, there was a few different rooms that you could go to. Right through the hallway behind the buffet is a large work area with this desk with high stools and the second area with five or six independent workstations as well, a good place to get work done while you're eating. There was also a printer and desktops for people who needed to borrow a computer or print something. The back of the lounge had a ton of seats and was also super busy, although there was some empty seats if you didn't mind being part of someone else's group. It also had views of the streets outside and the entrance to the terminal that we entered about 15-20 minutes ago. Back here is also where we find workspaces and showers. The workrooms are set up like a conference room, so if you need to get work done with more people or maybe need a bit more privacy, then this may be perfect for you. Unfortunately, I didn't get to use the showers since I was short on time, which was heartbreaking if you know me. Back into the main part of the lounge, there is a ton more seating, mostly in groups. I was actually kind of shocked at how many open seats there were just because the busy time of the day was just winding down. But there was plenty of seats in groups even, so no problem for people needing to spread out a little bit. I also think I might have set an all-time speed record. When I filmed my first shot outside the terminal, my flight was scheduled to depart in an hour and 15 minutes. 
Luckily, my bags were checked through from my first flight, so I didn't have to worry about that. Then with fast track security and a lot of sprinting around the airport to make sure I could get as much footage as possible, we made it to the gate about two minutes before they called for group on boarding. At this point, boarding was in about 10 minutes, but remember we still haven't cleared immigration. Because I was running late, immigration was just about empty as we were towards the last of the US departures and everyone who didn't have a delayed inbound flight was already through immigration. Once through immigration, US bound flights have to proceed to a security counter to the side to verify that you know all the contents of your bag. Then you receive the stamp to prove it, which you show upon boarding. Then through the doorway and onto the E-gates. There's a collection of a few gates here that were solely being used for US flights, where our flight was the first gate. There was almost no view of our airplane, but we could see it by going around the corner to the next gate in addition to the matching A330 that was Chicago bound shortly. Thanks to all the running that I did for the last couple hours since arriving from Milan late, I made it to the gate about two minutes before boarding began. SAS boards by groups and being in business class put me in group 1 along with all the Star Alliance gold members, so there was actually quite a bit of people in group 1. That being said, this flight was actually somewhat empty. According to the flight attendants, this flight is usually packed and they were guessing that the proximity to Christmas was the main reason that people weren't filling it. SAS business class is only available on long haul flights on their A330, A350, and A321LR fleet, as their medium and short haul fleet only has SAS plus class, or basically premium economy. Now these seats aren't new, being around since the days of their A340s, but their design stands the test of time. Even though the seat shape and structure is a very familiar style to other A330s, the colors they use are top tier. If you refer back to my South African Airways video for example, you'll see that the seat looks exactly the same but with different colors. These are typically the two that people say have the best colors, but personally, I take SAS as my favorite. It's just such a timeless and Scandinavian look. As far as the layout, you'll want an even numbered seat as the counter provides you with some extra privacy. You can see here that the odd numbered rows are just a bit more exposed to the aisle. And while people finish boarding, let's take a look around the seat that we're sitting in today, seat 6A. First off, the headrest has the SAS branding on it. The headrest itself, however, is pretty normal, being able to tilt and curl in at the edges to help maximize your comfort. The seat itself I found to be pretty soft and wide enough to get comfortable, especially considering that the armrest is movable to make it a bit wider. That side armrest, which does help for filming out the window and supporting my arm, can be lowered here with that little flap on the leading edge. Pull that flap out, you can lower it all the way down or lift it all the way back up. There were technically three windows at my seat, although a couple of them were blocked. Plenty of windows, however, to get sufficient views of our departure and arrival. The TV in front of us is a nice size, although extremely reflective, and doesn't tilt at all. It does, however, have a USB port at the very least. Next to the TV is a few things, including the coat hook and a literature pocket that really didn't have anything in it at this point. Below that was another literature pocket. This one housed the safety card and the information on how to connect to SAS's Wi-Fi. Below the TV is the footrest. I found it to be plenty wide for just relaxing, although it does get a little bit narrow for sleep. The incline, however, is great for resting your feet. You just can't really store anything there considering it's soft items only, so really just the bedding. The countertop is great to have, especially if you want to get a little bit of work done while you're eating your meal. And speaking of eating, with the push of a button you can release your tray table, which can swivel out in front of you. It's a nice size and can be slid closer to or further from you. There are a couple quick adjustments here right behind the tray table release. However, the main adjustments are located up on the counter on the bigger panel. On that panel, you can use the presets for sitting, relaxing, or laying. You can adjust the lumbar support or the leg rest individually. In addition to the massage feature, and the lighting. Speaking of lighting, you also have another reading light here that can swivel and adjust the dimness. The storage in the seat begins with this little cubby here for a water bottle that they supplied for us. Then there's this nice little shelf with a lip so that things don't fall out of it. There's also a little hook for the headphones that they supplied us with the seat. Also this little space underneath which isn't enclosed and doesn't really have a lip so you couldn't use it really for all that much. 
the remote here does pop out and has a few features, albeit limited. On the front to control the light and the flight attendant call button, and on the back really just enough to move around the screen. Next to that is where we have the universal and USB charging ports along with the headset jack. Lastly, and unfortunately, but you know I have to mention it, there were no overhead individual air vents available at the seats. Then for the amenities, SAS provides these noise cancelling headphones which may have been the most comfortable in-flight headphones I've ever been given, not to mention the noise cancelling quality was fantastic. Then the SAS bedding which was reimagined earlier this year. Began with this pillow, it was a nice size, although a little thin for my taste. I ended up balling up my hoodie underneath my head for additional support. Then the blanket. It wasn't exactly the thickest thing in the world, although with no overhead air vents, it was never really too cold on board either. Then the amenity kits, which do match the bedding, although they don't have a ton of stuff in them. Everything you would need at least though, however, like an eye mask and socks, with earplugs, a dental kit, lip balm, and a face cream or hand cream. Then the SAS menu. The SAS menu comes in a few pages starting first with the drinks. The first page has the cocktails, spirits, and beer options, followed by the white and champagne wine options. The next page with the red wines and their apple must. Then the food, starting first with what they called the main event, or the big meal we were given just after departure. Following that is our pre-arrival meal, just a cold meal, but still delicious, and then some of their mid-flight snack options. And lastly, before departure, we were given our choice of beverage, for which I decided to go with the champagne. Now for splitting hairs, what I will say is possibly the only drawback of this cabin is that the dark colors expose the scratches a lot more. If you look around, you'll just see little marks from over time as the dark exterior has been scratched away and exposed the lighter underneath. And while we were sitting here ready to push back, the toilets broke, so they had to get a technician on to fix that. While he was fixing that, however, a mysterious blizzard appeared. Snow had started falling, this meant that by the time he finished it, we now couldn't just take off but instead had to go get de-iced. As we taxi for de-icing and await our departure, which came about an hour and 45 minutes behind schedule just due to our lavatory issue, and now the issue with Mother Nature, let's chat a little bit about the history of this Northern European airline staple. Scandinavian Airlines has actually been around for roughly 75 years, mostly flying within Europe. Due to their northern location, they were actually the first airline to launch polar routes, or routes up near the North Pole and Arctic polar ice caps. In the 1950s, they conducted a flight to Los Angeles via a couple stops in a DC-8, and then to Tokyo via Anchorage. Not only was this important to their survival as a young airline trying to reach the Americas, but also with the Soviet airspace being closed, they needed a way to reach East Asia. SAS actually had a few steps they took in the 1990s in order to attempt forming a global alliance, including taking up a stake in the parent company of Continental Airlines, before finally helping United and Air Canada start the Star Alliance, along with Lufthansa and Thai. This helped them initiate their push towards North America. The 2000s, however, brought along some financial hardships for the airline, primarily caused by the emergence of successful budget airlines in Europe. SAS was forced to restructure a bit, adding more cost-cutting programs, especially within Europe, which continued well into the 2010s. COVID obviously destroyed the airline, as it did with most airlines, but their post-COVID events seem to be proving successful for the airline, as they've seen a definite increase in load factor since COVID, beating their pre-COVID numbers, some sources reporting it in even the mid-80%. In addition, as part of their cost-cutting restructuring, there's a large push towards sustainability, which can also lower operating costs and taxes in a lot of areas of operation. As a matter of fact, in accordance with an initiative set forth by the San Francisco International Airport, SAS has even switched to sustainable aviation fuel for their flights out of SFO. All of these being factors in the continuing plummet of emissions per aircraft for the airline. As for their role fleet, the EU market has their bread and butter, so they try to equip best for that. Pushing towards a single type fleet, they're trying to utilize the A320 and A321neos, retiring their 737s. They also have a regional fleet of Embraer 195s and CRJs. And lastly, their long haul fleet. As they moved on from the A340, the A330 became kind of a flagship for their long haul network. This was until they placed an order for eight A350s. 
due to a change in demand, however, their Asian push has been somewhat reduced to only Tokyo and Shanghai. And they reduced their A350s to three, selling some, returning some to lessers. They do serve eight destinations in the US at this moment, and have been at SFO for quite a while, due to their partnership and alliance with United Airlines. Although it seems like there were a ton of point-to-point -point travelers on my flight today, so maybe the United connections aren't the be-all end-all. The crew also said that this flight is usually packed, despite it being a little less than three quarters full on today's flight. This flight actually used to operate in the morning time, and this was to prioritize connections in Copenhagen, with the airplane returning from San Francisco at 7am in Copenhagen, maximizing available connections despite the strange 11am departure from SFO. Although things seem to have resumed to a bit more of a normal time, I can't tell the exact stats, but I'm curious if this indicates that there's better point-to-point -point traffic than they had originally assumed. It also could have been because there isn't really a bank of Copenhagen departures, instead just about 10 to 20 hourly departures, mostly across Europe. Not to mention that the airplane had to sit in San Francisco for almost a full 24 hours, making utilization and parking costs horrendous but I guess it worked for using the same crew for the round trip journey. As far as the in-flight entertainment system goes on SAS, first off, the homepage had a few of these quick links where you could learn a little bit about the airline, some of the things they were doing, some of the things they had done, and some of the plans for this flight. The main menu here had a lot of the familiar sites. Starting with movies, however, you can see that there's 119 total movie titles. Plenty of options across plenty of genres. The only thing I'll say is that it wasn't exactly the normal movies that you would expect to see on a flight. I actually seem to find better movies in the kids section. At the very least, I did appreciate being able to add things to favorites. By tapping the star there, it adds it to your favorite list, making things a little bit easier to find later on in the flight. Although it says 172 TV shows, it's really 172 episodes. So you have to go to the category to see how many there are. For example, under the comedy category, once again, a strange selection, but at least it's not the normal Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon that every airline seems to go with. The SAS TV option was kind of fun, learning about the airline and some of their destinations. Then the music, once again, not exactly the normal albums, but you will find some highlights of each genre, and under some genres, you will find specific artists. Then was the kids section, specifically movies, TV shows, and games for kids. Honestly, some of my favorite movies were right here. There was a fairly good selection of games, but once again, I didn't end up playing them on this flight. 
Then the in-flight menu, which in all reality was all the drinks, none of the food since that changes on a flight-by-flight -flight basis. But it was fun learning about some of the stuff, including the apple must, which I was curious about. The outside cameras were cool, considering we could get a forward or downward view. Fun as we taxied out to the de-ice pad. Then was the map. If you know this channel, you know that I like the ones that are fully adjustable, and unfortunately this is not one of them. It does play through the pre-recorded series of different zooms and flight information, but you kind of just have to sit back and enjoy the journey. If you're looking to see an overview of the entire route, for example, you're going to have to wait for it to flip through everything else. Then connecting to the in-flight Wi-Fi. SAS does have in-flight Wi-Fi, at least on their long-haul fleet, which is nice considering that on this flight we were able to connect by just selecting the Wi-Fi network, opening your camera and scanning the QR code at the seat, and then typing in the booking information. You might ask why they need the booking information, and the reason is business class travelers have free full flight Wi-Fi. I didn't actually get to see how much the normal Wi-Fi would cost because upon typing in my booking information, I was automatically connected. It was easy as that. As we flew over Norway, however, it was dinner time as the placemats were served up and I decided to start with the sparkling water and try out that apple must that piqued my interest earlier on along with a bowl of cashews. I found it fun as well that the flight attendants changed into the appropriate chef clothing so that they wouldn't get their normal uniforms dirty while serving meals. They had me try out one of their Chianti wines from Tuscany along with the bread before coming by with all of the different starters. They came by with a cart full of their different starters and we could choose any of them. I decided to go with this salmon dish and the side salad. As I admire the carved logo into the silverware and we awaited our entree, I was suggested their signature beverage, so I did try that as well. It was apple, whiskey, and ginger ale. Pretty tasty, honestly. Then came the entree. It was braised beef burnt end with black garlic and rosemary sauce, some potatoes, and then Brussels sprouts with caramelized hazelnuts. Absolutely delicious and cooked perfectly. As with each course of the meal, they came by with the chef's trolley with the different options. For dessert, for example, I took the meringue and the fruit plate. Dinner wrapped up, it was time to take a look at the seat and bed modes of this lie flat business class seat. We know that there are the presets for sitting, relaxing, and laying, so we'll take a look as we progress through that. This does bring the leg rest up to a considerable amount and gets you into a nice relaxing mode. In addition, the incline leading up to the foot rest is a nice place to rest your feet while you're in the relaxed mode. From there, we can hold the last preset to get it into the fully lie flat position. It goes completely flat and the leg rest joins with the foot rest. In addition, to make it all just a little bit wider, you can lower that armrest on the side all the way down. My main critique, however, looked a little bit dirty in the cracks of the seat once I reclined it. The bedding was fairly easy to set up starting off with just the pillow. As you can see it takes up all the space nicely as it's a good sized pillow, just a little thin like I mentioned earlier. Along with the pillow nothing better than a matching comforter. Not the widest comforter in the world, barely wider than the seat itself so if you're tossing and turning it might get caught and fall off of you. However, it is nice that it reaches all the way to the end of the footwell meaning that even if you're tall, you'll have plenty of comforter for you. Now if you sleep on your back in this seat, you'll see here that you really have no issue. There's plenty of space for your feet left, right, up, down, but if you sleep on your side, you're going to have a little bit of some space issues. Not necessarily with your feet, as you can see they can move, but your shins are going to keep hitting that hard plastic shell. And as I prepare for sleep with the lights still up, I will mention that I only planned to sleep for a couple hours since I had some work I needed to get done. Not sure what happened even though I set an alarm, but I didn't wake up until the cabin lights were brought up for our arrival meal, only about an hour and a half prior to reaching San Francisco, so I'll let that speak volumes for the bed itself. I woke up in a bit of a panic just because of how much work I had to get done versus how long I had ended up sleeping. If there was one critique, however, that I had to offer to the bed, it's that since the TV doesn't tilt, when you're in the lie flat position, it does distort that picture a little bit. Now since I slept through most of the flight, we didn't get to explore the snack bar. 
When I woke up, they were just starting to put it away as they prepared for breakfast. However, if you get hungry or thirsty in the middle of the flight, you can venture to the back of the business class cabin where you'll find this cabinet. In there, you'll find sandwiches, sweets, snacks, teas, coffee, and cold drinks. Anything else you need, you can ask the flight crew. Now as far as the lavatory goes, if you watch my channel, you know that one of my biggest critiques is that they tend to be big white boxes. One way to fix that is what they did here, just add a window. If it's daytime, you have a complete illumination of the restroom of the outside light. If it's nighttime, you get a good view of the passing towns and city lights outside. It also had an incredible amount of space, although I will mention the restroom on the right side of the aircraft was about double the size as the one on the left side. As we made our way across the Pacific Northwest, the flight attendants put on their chef's coats, grabbed the chef's trolleys, and prepared for our pre-landing meal, for which I chose to go with the salmon tartare open face sandwich option, which was incredible, alongside a cup of fruit and the chocolate truffles. To drink, along with my orange juice, I decided to get a cup of tea as well. As we were beginning our descent about a half hour from San Francisco, we were shown a pre-arrival safety video. Maybe the first time that I've seen one of those. And as we make our descent into San Francisco, some big news that happened just a few months prior to this flight at SAS. Now some of you may be familiar with the fact that earlier this year SAS made a very surprising change to their alliance. In 1997, SAS was one of the founding members of the Star Alliance, along with United Airlines, Air Canada, Lufthansa, and Thai Airways. Their partnerships had always been increasingly strong, other than some disruption during the COVID pandemic. But the agreements between these airline partners was a large reason for SAS's U.S. destination choices, at least as I know SFO at the very least, had plenty of connecting Star Alliance partners from other United hubs. In August of this year, SAS entered Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection for another year, giving them 100 days from that point, or just barely into January of 2024, to restructure their plan as the court felt that was in the best interest of their debtors. As it turns out, the result of this restructuring, whether the initial plan or not, ended up being selling just under 20% of the company to the Air France KLM Group, one of Europe's largest airline groups. It just so happens that Air France KLM, however, was a founding member of the Sky Team Alliance, meaning that this new partnership would force SAS out of the alliance that they helped found into the Sky Team Alliance. One has to wonder how this would affect their route structure to San Francisco and New York, which have been a big part of their strategy plan, but without Star Alliance, you have to think they'll become less successful. Although I can't find the exact stats for the amount of point-to-point -point travelers from SFO to Europe on SAS, versus how many people connect at SFO. SAS already recently added JFK in addition to Newark, so I guess they'll start moving over there. Then I wonder if we'll see more Delta hubs served, like Minneapolis, Detroit, Atlanta, or Salt Lake City. With nothing quite official yet, we await the judge's final decision on the acquirement to see what happens with SAS. My final thoughts on SAS are pretty easy, considering I really wanted to spend more time at every step of the way. I wanted more time in the lounge, I wanted more time on the plane, I wanted more time dining. I think I officially just have a new favorite European business class product. And of course, it's right when they change alliances and are at risk of leaving my home airport. I actually may plan to fly their A350s at some point, as I feel like the only thing that could make it better is a slightly larger airplane and longer flight. So maybe I'll check out their Tokyo Ops at some point. As far as the debrief and thoughts, the airport experience was super easy, and if I weren't stuck behind a family at the fast track security, I would have probably been through everything in less than 5 minutes. The terminal at Copenhagen is nice, and I do know as a fact that there are still plenty of places to get good views of the ramp and adjacent terrain. We just happen to be in the land of construction. 
Their Christmas decorations were nice, but I wouldn't say that they were any better than the likes of airports like Amsterdam. Speaking of which, if you know of an airport with good Christmas decorations, let me know so I can add it to next year's December itinerary. The lounge was great. It may not be the biggest lounge in the world, but the airline isn't the biggest operation in the world either. I think it fits the brand perfectly. I was pleasantly surprised on the amount of areas and available spaces for people even in the busy times. I just wish that I had more time to explore the upstairs area and maybe take a shower. But I guess we'll save something for next time. Now the onboard experience, where really SAS had me sold. The colors they chose to use were very Scandinavian, but really worked in this cabin. The seat design is familiar with the A330, but the colors I think were at an all-time best. The service is where I really found them thriving, from the flight attendants dressing in proper attire, to not get their uniforms dirty, to the individual courses being served one at a time from a cart with choices. They also had a great drink selection, including their own signature drink. The bed was comfortable enough for me to get a full night's sleep by accident as well, so I guess that's something. All of this combined made it a great experience. If given the choice, SAS would probably be my go-to choice on long-haul flights to Europe. I hope I can try out their long haul again in addition to seeing maybe how their narrow body long haul services match up to this. Let me know your thoughts down below however. Happy holidays to you all, see you all next Sunday, but until then, safe travels, and I'll see you all next time.